Good morning to all my friends and family and welcome to this episode of Jim's 5am Club. I'm down here at Cockle Bay and as you can see it's the time of year where Sydney celebrates the boat show with uh, the whole of Cockle Bay, Darling Harbour, jam-packed with yachts of all sizes and descriptions and it's just wall to wall beautiful beautiful boats the uh, boat show commences on Thursday and runs for four days and there's a section here with all the boats the big boats one could say and over in the convention center they'll have all the smaller boats as well as all the gadgets all the technology and all the other things for people to see and uh, I guess it's going to be an exciting time of year to come down with family and friends and just experience the atmosphere of uh, this part of Sydney uh, at this time of year because Sydney is a happening place we've got the Women's World Cup on at the moment and I'm going to watch a match tonight between France and Panama we're slowly getting to the knockout rounds so the group stages are about to finish and it's going to get exciting from this point on the Matildas played very well the other night against Canada and they're uh, buoyed with hope and belief and who knows how deep they can go into this competition but uh, they'll be playing Denmark in the first knockout match hopefully they can get through Denmark and uh, then maybe go on to play France or one of the other teams that makes it through their knockout round so what I'd like to do today on this beautiful Wednesday morning here in Sydney town and I'll just walk and talk is I want to talk about a vlog that I listened to the other day by Elder Nectarios he's a uh, a monk in, in Greece who runs a monastery so he's an abbot he runs a beautiful big monastery with about 30 monks under his guidance spiritual guidance and he has just returned from a trip to Turkey and uh, he talks about Turkey in uh, in terms of modern uh, modern terms as well as ancient and historical terms as well and I learnt things that I wasn't quite aware of in terms of uh, what's happened over time so I don't really know where to start but I'll just get started and uh, see where it leads me see where it takes me but Yeron Nectarios I guess kicks off by trying to position things where he says that there was once a time where most Greek people, most Greek speaking people, most Greek people lived outside of where Greece is at the moment. So when you look at Greece on a map at the moment, you will see that it occupies a, a geographic reg region within Europe. But the Greeks have uh, for many, many hundreds of years 
occupied lands outside their current geographical limitations. So much so that Yeron Nectario says that at a time, just in terms of relative terms, at a time when there was, say, a million Greeks in the Greece that we know at the moment, there would have been three or more million Greeks living in Asia Minor. So there were more Greeks living outside of Greece um, during those 3,000 years that have passed than ha that have lived in where Greece is at the moment. And over the years, um, the Greeks who were Greek Orthodox were under pressure during the Ottoman rule. Um, so much so that according to Yeron Nektarios, the majority of those Greeks converted to Islam and became Muslim. And the ones who didn't convert back in 1920 in the Treaty of Lucerne um, were submitted to a uh, population exchange where the Greek Orthodox living in Turkey or what is modern day Turkey which would have been in ancient times known as Asia Minor, Mikriasia, um, were, were swapped out and uh, returned to Greece as migrants, leaving behind all of their friends, all of their families, all of their businesses, their houses, their wealth, and everything that they'd toiled for. But yet on Nectario says that there are many, there were many Greeks, many Greek Orthodox who chose not to return to Greece, who chose, chose the simple way, the simple road for them. And what they did was that they just simply converted to Islam and became Muslims, as we said before, so much so that Cyprus, so not, not Cyprus, Crete, sorry about that, the Cretans, 40% of Cretans became Muslim and uh, with the population exchanges that 40% left Crete and went and lived in places like Syria and other places within the Middle East so many, many Turks that you see today are actually Greeks who became um, Muslims and stayed in Turkey for convenience. They kept their businesses, they kept their lifestyle, they just changed religion. And initially, they may have been crypto-Christians they may have been people who did not intend to stay Muslim all their life, but just did it for convenience. But what Yeron Nektario says is that with time, with generations, you know, with the family growing and each generation passing, the ones who may have been crypto-Christians are now full-blooded Muslims and probably will never convert back to their Christian roots uh, because it's now embedded in their families and in their cultures. What else does Yeron Nectarios talk about? He talked about the persecution that the Christians uh, had the slavery, um, the pressure, uh, because you can live within a culture which says that you can be Christian, but if by being Christian you pay more taxes, 
if by being being Christian you're treated differently if by being Christian you uh, you are not uh, given all of the benefits of the rest of society then it is racism at its very very worst to say the least and persecution and the other int interesting thing the very interesting thing that I learned from Yeron Nectarios was that in Turkey you will not find a Greek Orthodox Church so that you can freely um, go to church and live your faith the churches that remain in Turkey the churches that haven't been destroyed by the Turks are now either museums or some other place where you can't freely go to and you need to seek permission so there are churches there are a few Greek churches in, in Turkey where the bishops need to seek permission in order to have um, services and interesting to note and I wasn't quite aware of this and I remember going and seeing a movie about uh, Zmidni, the burning of Zmidni and it was quite a traumatic movie of course but what Yeron Nectarius reminds us of here is that back in 1920 when there was the ethnic cleansing performed by the Turks what actually happened there was that only the Greeks and only the Armenians, so only the Orthodox were persecuted the Greek Orthodox and the Armenian Orthodox who lived in Turkey were the ones who were persecuted the ones whose homes were destroyed the ones who were killed who were maimed and who were made destitute the Jews the Catholics uh, the Protestants all the other faiths were untouched and in Zmidni the only homes that were burnt were the ones of the Greeks and of the Armenians they lived in quarters they lived in suburbs they congregated in certain suburbs and it was those suburbs where the Greeks and the Armenians lived were the ones that were destroyed and the Greeks and the Armenians were the ones who were killed and what uh, Yeron Nectarius reminds us of here is that it wasn't actually the Turks who did all the burning and all the killing it was the Jetis, Jetis who had been given permission by the Turkish authorities to do their dirty work so it's important to understand that things happen and things happen in funny sort of ways not funny funny but funny strange ways in order for people to hide their agenda and what they're trying to achieve by getting other people to do their dirty work and Yeron Nectarius also says that a lot of this damage to the Greek Orthodox to the Armenian Orthodox Church was done under the guidance and under the um, approval of the West who didn't step in because what they wanted to do was to try and reduce the authority of the Eastern Orthodox Church 
and give rise to other powers. So back in the days when the Byzantine Empire was coming to an end and the church, the Eastern Orthodox Church was losing power. Um, it was the West that benefited. It was the West who benefited significantly from the booty, from what they stole when they um, raided Constantinople. Um, and I remember reading somewhere that 400 churches in Europe were built um, with the relics, the spiritual relics that they'd taken, stolen, the gold, the ivory, the jewels that they'd stolen from uh, Hagia Sophia, Constantinople, because at one point in time, Constantinople was the richest city in all of Europe. And I think in terms of putting things into relative perspective, I think that over 50% of the wealth of Europe was in Constantinople. So when the city was, uh, was raised to the ground and the church looted of their booty, much of what was stolen was used to fund and to ignite the economic growth, the economic progress and the enlightenment of the West um, at the expense of the East. So um, it's important to learn from the past. It's important to understand how things occur in order to uh, try and um, put things into perspective and to understand how things are today because of what happened um, at some other time in our history. For those who speak Greek, now I do recommend you listening to the tape, to the uh, podcast put together by Yeron Nectarios because uh, he is a man who speaks well um, and has a vast understanding from a spiritual perspective of history and it's quite enlightening to see what had happened. So the authorities, as Yeron Nectarios says, gave the go-ahead to the Turks, uh, who gave the go-ahead to the Chechens, and as we said, there was a population exchange. So the, the Turks who were not Greek Orthodox or the non-Greek Orthodox who lived in Greece um, were forced to go back to Turkey and the ones in Turkey were forced to go back to Greece and some converted, if not, as I said before, the majority converted to become Muslim from the Turkish side. And that's why when you see Turkish people, a lot of them look Greek. And the reason why they look Greek is that they are Greek. And yet they decided to stay and to remain in modern day Turkey, in Asia Minor for convenience reasons and there's also relics from the past where the sultans would actually take young Greek boys or young Serbian boys or young people from the uh, from uh, from the from Europe and um, use use them as uh, I forget the word but they will become uh, administrators 
of the Sultan's uh, agenda. And they'd also steal the young girls, the daughters of the, uh, the Greeks and the Slavs and put them in t uh, and use them as concubines and breed with them. So hence, there's a lot of Greek DNA in Turkey um, and it was forcefully done and and in some in some ways it was uh, agreed upon for convenience purposes so just imagine today here in Australia if people if the Greek Orthodox were given a choice to stay Greek Orthodox and pay additional taxes lose their businesses um, uh, lose their their schools and their privileges or convert to another religion and be able to keep everything I dare say that the vast majority would say I'll give up my Christian faith and follow the faith of the state be it the rainbow flag be it the indigenous uh, indigenous flag or be it some other consumerist flag that they'd be happy to give up their Christianity uh, in order to keep the conveniences of their modern life. Anyway, thank you very much for joining me on this morning walk and talk on this beautiful day in Sydney. Uh, I'm talking about a very difficult topic that not very many people are aware of the background too. But yet on Nectarios also mentioned the fact that whilst there aren't too many Greek Orthodox churches in uh, Turkey at the moment, because as we said, they're all burnt down, some still survive. The ones that survive are the ones which were outside of the suburbs where the Greeks were. So when they say Zmidni was burnt and destroyed, it wasn't all of Zmidni. Zmidni today is like Glifada. It's a beautiful middle-class suburb in Turkey. The only parts of Zmidni that were burnt were the ones where the Greeks and the Armenians lived. So any churches, any houses in those particular areas were burnt to the ground. The only buildings that were saved were the ones where the Sultan said you know, to preserve that building. So there are a couple of Greek buildings that have survived, but it's only because of their architectural beauty or their significance that enable them to survive. So all the other buildings survived, the buildings of the, of the Catholics, the Jews, the Protestants, and everybody else survived. Now, only the Greeks and the Armenians were the ones who suffered. Everybody else was spared. So it's important to understand that and to keep it and to um, appreciate the perspective that Yeron Nectarios brings, brings. Anyway, take care. Have a wonderful rest of the day. And we'll chat again. Yasas and go the Matildas. I would just like to supplement what Yeron Nectario said about the reasons that the Greeks and the Armenians of Ismidni were murdered and set on fire and uh, expelled. What had happened, from what I understand, is at the end of World War I or thereabouts uh, during the uh, Greek-Turkish War the Greeks whilst on retreat were going through and burning and killing Turks and once the Sultan heard of this they say and Yeronektarios punctuates and says 
that this very thing is what inflamed the Sultan and got him to get rid of the Greeks in Zmidni and elsewhere within Greece, within uh, Asia Minor. So um, that's just uh, one opinion, one view, but it's a view that is supported by Yeron Nektarios. But he also says that um, the Turks under the Ottoman Empire and the Turks from the 1920s, the Turkey of today is very much different, very much advanced and under the new constitution. Anybody can go and live in Turkey and get Turkish citizenship. All you need to do is deposit 250,000 euro into a Turkish bank or buy a house worth 250,000 euro or properties worth 250,000 euro or more and you can become a citizen and within with that citizenship and also living in Turkey you know you can enjoy the freedoms that everybody else enjoys even though there are no Greek churches Greek Orthodox churches um, you can go if you wish to you can migrate and go back to the places where your forefathers and ancestors were displaced and carry on from where they left off and live a pretty good life from what Yeron Nectarios suggests without persecution without fear of being bullied or harassed and to live a fairly normal sort of life in 2023. So once again, it's a balanced sort of view that he gives us. And he did say that Turkey has advanced in many ways and that their national leader, Erdogan, has done a lot for Turkey and not to believe all of the media and hype that is against him for you know, he has a lot to protect he's got a huge influx of tourists every year and the last thing on Erdogan's mind is to have a war with Greece because with that would come economic catastrophe uh, through you know reduced tourism and all of those things so uh, it's important to put things into, pers things into perspective or to at least think about things from a different perspective and to understand that in 2023 um, there are other agendas there are uh, other people who absolutely love causing strife between Greece and its neighbours as well as any other country with their neighbours. You know, we see it happening in Ukraine with Russia because what that means is that when you cause grief, when you cause abrasion and friction, it means more weapons being purchased. And when a country like Greece, a small economy like Greece, spends an inordinate amount on money, of money on weapons, that it means that it's got less money to invest in infrastructure, less money to invest in its hospitals, its education, its development, and all the other areas. Whereas Yeron Nektarios was saying that Turkey today, 2023, and I do want to go there one day soon to, to have a holiday and to check it out. He says that it's a hundred years more advanced than what Greece is at the moment. It's a hundred years ahead in terms of its roads, its buildings. Now, Constantinople, Istanbul itself has over 900 skyscrapers and it's got holiday resorts and it's got roads and the hospitals and the cleanliness is remarkable. 
Um, so a different sort of um, picture being painted by Hierro Nectarios to the pictures and news items that we hear in the Greek press. So I guess for each and every one of us, the challenge is to go and see ourselves and to make up our own minds and to have a balanced view on how things are rather than to be skewed by past opinions of uh, days gone by with opinions which are no longer relevant and opinions which can easily be manipulated for financial benefit, not of the Greeks, not of the Turks, but of other people outside of the fold. Anyway, take care and something to contemplate at least.